1971, he said that global temperatures could decrease by over three degrees. And he pointed out that if this happened, it could be enough to trigger a new ice age. It all seemed to fit together. The climate was cooling and there was a theory to explain why. But it didn't last. There's a saying in science along the lines of there's nothing so sad as a beautiful theory destroyed by an ugly fact. And in 1976, along came an ugly fact. The summer of 1976 broke all records. Blazing heat and woodland fires have destroyed hundreds of acres of Surrey in the last two days. If water isn't saved in the home, jobs will be affected. As it happens, I remember the summer of 1976 really well. I was 12 and I was on a family holiday to Clondudno. And I remember it for two reasons. One was, my brother got pooed on by a seagull. Still makes me chuckle up. But the second was, it was just so damn hot. And not just here. Across the world, 30 years of cooling came to an abrupt end. The planet began to warm up. And as the warming trend strengthened, it became clear that the science behind the Ice Age theory was flawed. For the scientists who had been associated with the coming Ice Age, it was a chastening experience. Well, nobody likes to be wrong. But remember, I never said, I predict that we're going to induce an Ice Age. What I said was, under these assumptions, this is what you get. Other scientists say that could trigger an Ice Age. You know, it's easy to criticize Schneider, but to me, there was nothing wrong in what he did. This is how science works. You've got a theory, you look for evidence, the evidence doesn't fit, you change the theory. The Ice Age theory was based on what was known at the time. When new data came in, Schneider changed his mind. I think he deserves a bit of credit for that. With cooling off the agenda, the question now was very different. Why was the planet warming up? For many years, a group of scientists had been working on an alternative theory about what was happening to the climate. Now, their time had come. The roots of this alternative theory lay with an obsessional genius by the name of Dave Keeling. All the leaves are brown. If the scientific discovery of global warming has a hero, then Keeling is probably it. In 1956, a young Dave Keeling arrived here at San Diego's premier academic institution, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Keeling had a simple desire, to be outside preferably in wild and beautiful places. It's not unlike the reason that I took up geology. The difference is that unlike me, Keeling turned into a genuine scientific hero. As a kid, Keeling put together a lovingly crafted scrapbook of photographs from around the world that inspired him. Now as a researcher, he looked for a way to combine his love of science with his love of the outdoors. And in the late 1950s, he found it. He would focus on a problem that scientists were just beginning to worry about, measuring the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
studying carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere had little to commend itself to an ambitious young scientist. But Keeling didn't care. He got the chance to throw his sleeping bag into the back of the car and take off to all these amazing locations, all in the name of scientific research. So off he went, visiting all sorts of wonderful places, all in an apparently obscure quest to measure carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. It may not have attracted much attention at the time, but Keeling's project turned out to be one of the most important pieces of scientific research ever conducted. Keeling died in 2005, but today his son Ralph continues his work. So how did Keeling Sr. measure carbon dioxide? This is a, a hollow glass sphere wrapped in tape. This snaky thing is a valve for right. opening and closing. It's like a stopcock, looks it's like. In a, it is, in fact, a stopcock. Right. The, the flask is evacuated in the lab, so all the air that's in it is sucked out of it. So it's a vacuum. It's a vacuum in here right now. And then one simply ships this or carries it to a location where one wants to get an air sample, and you hold it up, right. and you expose it to the atmosphere. Now, the tricky bit the only really tricky bit is to make sure you don't contaminate it, either right. by having something nearby like a car or your own breath. So attention has to be oh. given to of course, obtaining a clean sample. Coming yes. out your mouth, could it get in there? And yeah. So do you not breathe then? Yeah, so you, shall I show you how it works? <laughs> you can hold your breath. <laughs> okay. So, Does it take long? Uh, no, no, it's, oh, quite, it's quite simple. You, uh, you simply face into the wind, mm -hmm. hold your breath. <gasps> So there we have a sample. I heard it. It's been, I can tell it's full. Wow. Yeah. But it turned out that getting the sample of air was the easy bit. Much trickier was working out how much carbon dioxide was in the flask. Others had tried to do it before, but their figures differed wildly. The key to Keeling's success was his obsessive attention to detail. This was a man who kept logs of all his phone calls throughout his life. Even as a young boy, he kept a meticulous record of his watering rota in the family garden. Now he brought all his obsessive analytical zeal to the problem of how much carbon dioxide was inside his flasks of air. He abandoned the hills and moved into a lab. And rather magically, it turns out his equipment is still here. This is pretty much the exact apparatus that Keeling used to extract carbon dioxide and to measure its concentration in the atmosphere. It may look like a museum piece, but this works. In fact, all the modern instruments that measure carbon dioxide are calibrated, are standardised with this. In 1958, Keeling's complicated network of glass tubes delivered the first truly accurate measure of how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere. It was a technical triumph. But Keeling wasn't satisfied. He knew that humans were pumping more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from cars, power stations, factories and aircraft. He wondered if this meant that the level of carbon dioxide in the air would change over time. The only way to find out was to keep doing his measurements year after year. Not everyone could see the point. Over the years, there were many attempts to cut his funding. But Keeling battled on. He saw the value of keeping that going because it was documenting an essential phenomenon of the time. This idea of creating a baseline against which you compare other processes. Right. I mean, if he hadn't stuck with it, we wouldn't have that record. And, and, and I don't think the rest of the community quite appreciated it well, as well as he